<clears throat> okay. Looks like we have about 14 people logged on. It's just four. Maybe we'll slowly get started with introductions. Um, so thank you all for joining us tonight for a Friends from the Field webinar. This is an educational series of online programs that is co-hosted by Blue Hill Heritage Trust, um, where I'm the outreach coordinator, and Island Heritage Trust, where Martha Bell is the environmental educator. Um, we've been doing this for about four years now, I think. So we have quite a suite of past recordings, if you're ever interested in checking them out and haven't done that yet. Um, all sorts of naturalist topics and others related to the land. Um, and today we're super excited to introduce Kelsey Sullivan um, and his presentation on the ecology of ruffed grouse. Um, so I'll just read to you his bio. Hopefully you got a chance to look at our description, but I'll read it to you again. He is a wildlife biologist working with Maine Fish and Wildlife for 15 years, um, charged with monitoring wild, waterfowl, wild turkey, American woodcock, and ruffed grouse populations. Prior to this, he worked as a wildlife biologist in Alaska, studying seabird ecology in the wake of the Exxon Valdez oil spill. So thank you, Kelsey, so much for joining us tonight and sharing all of your knowledge and experience um, about the ruffed grouse. Welcome. Thank you. <clears throat> Um, oh, and sorry, Kelsey, I, yes. um, I normally, we haven't done webinars for a couple of weeks, so I'm a little rusty, but normally I pass it off to Martha real quick for a quick tech update and then pass it over to you. Well, we'll let Kelsey do his presentation. And then during that time, if you would like to put any questions into the chat feature, feel free to type that in. And Lander and I will go through those and present those to Kelsey at the end. Or if you'd like to ask your question in person, um, we do have the raise your hand feature so you can do it in your own voice. Thanks, Martha. <laughs> all right, Kelsey, it's all yours. Great, thanks. Um, yeah, and I, I'm always open if it works technologically. If folks have something that comes up while I'm talking, I'm happy to. You know, if that if we can navigate that, whatever, however it plays out, is fine with me. Um, but yeah, thank you for the invite and the opportunity to talk about one of the one of the species that I work with. Um, so my my charge as a wildlife biologist, I am a species specialist. There's several of us out of the Bangor office that are in the research and assessment section, and my species that I am charged with monitoring and conducting research on our um, game birds. So game birds that are harvested. We have several other, a few other bird group members that um, focus on other species, but I focus on, I gave some examples here. Um, so waterfowl, wild turkey, there's no woodcock picture. Um, and there's of course a grouse picture coming, but um, I'm fortunate to work on a Swedish species. The white-winged scoter is the top uh, the black duck with the white patch. Um, we have um, thousands that uh, winter off, offshore, but off the coast of Maine, but they don't breed here. Um, as opposed to the bottom uh, left, the common eider, we do have about 18,000. I think the last estimate was a little less than 18,000, 16,000 breeding common eiders off the coast of Maine. Um, the center picture is a blue winged teal which uh, we may have a few records of breeding in Maine, but um, they pass through through migration. So um, and then wild turkey, of course, and then the bottom picture is a brood of wood duck. And um, there's a focus on both breeding and wintering um, conservation for all ducks or all bird species that um, either pass through, breed, or just winter here. So. Um, it's over 200 species of birds that travel through or breed in Maine in any given point throughout the year. Um, so today we're going to just touch on one of the species that I work with is the rough grouse. Um, and I have a few slides on some 
basic life history characteristics, and then I'll discuss um, some important habitat characteristics because with rough grouse, really, if there's, they're like a species that they say, like the field of dreams, if you make it, they will come. If there's habitat that's conducive to rough grouse, generally you'll have a um, pretty substantial, sustainable population. Um, fortunately, in Maine, we have quite a bit of rough grouse habitat, so we have quite a few rough grouse. <clears throat> so just a few little snippets about their life history. Um, rough grouse, Bonassa umbellus, and I looked up the Latin meaning for that today. I always have to remind myself. And um, the Bonassa was a reference to, I think, the table fare of grouse. Um, and umbellus is the umbrella, which I think references the grout, the ruft around the collar that you see of the male and the female. Um, but they are feed mostly on vegetation. Uh, the young do eat insects when they're growing uh, in the summertime, but generally they're they're plant eaters and they eat a variety of plants, leaves and buds and berries. Um, they're pretty short lived. Um, a year or two on average is about the lifespan of a grouse, which is um, a pretty short lifespan. And <clears throat> the size of their clutch points to that. They, they're what's called an R selected species. They put all their energy into um, one or two breeding attempts. Um, so they lay, lay large clutches of eggs as opposed to um, uh, an example would be a, a common eider who lays uh, four eggs. They, and they live almost 20 years. So they hedge their bets. The grouse hedge their bets on pulling off a successful reproductive effort uh, with a bunch of eggs and the chances of at least one of them making it through the year um, is, is high. Or, or increases their chances of survival. Um, they they occupy habitats that are mixed, um, uh, and the key is the younger aspect of of these hardwood and softwood forests with some openings, and they need a combination of which I'll get into a little more detail about the habitat requirements or needs. They have a pretty wide distribution across North America, and you'll see that you find they're in northern latitudes, but also in higher altitudes. And so they've adapted to that, those conditions pretty well. And you don't find them much further south than, than the, the mid continent. And one of the primary, or one of the things that they've adapted to pretty well are snow conditions. And you can imagine northern latitudes have, have much higher snow loads or snow depths and higher altitudes do too, generally. So there's uh, two key um, adaptations that I wanted to point out, which I think are really, or one of them is pretty unique to grouse. And that's what they call these uh, fleshy pectinations on their toes. And you can see I've got some arrows pointing to the edges of their, their toes. They have these um, like flanges that you know, you think of it increases the surface area um, beyond just one toe bone. So you can multiply your surface area connection, um, you know, exponentially with the, the, the more the more pectinations they have on these toes. And basically that acts as snowshoes so they can travel across deep snow and, you know, help uh, navigate and avert predators and, um, um utilize the habitat they're in when there's challenges with deep snow. Um, another cool thing that they do is they what's called snow roosting and many folks may have walked in the woods and all of a sudden a bird pops out of the snow and that uh, would be a grouse that's hiding there, you know, taking refuge from the cold at night or um, taking a break from being exposed to predators uh, potentially taking them. And so that's uh, another good ad adaptation to the snow depths that they experience. Um, so now I'm going to kind of get into the habitat features that are uh, key to grouse survival and reproduction throughout the year. And I'll try to explain this. And I'll use my cursor if I can. Yeah, there we go. 
Can you see my cursor moving, Martha? Yes, I can. Okay, great. Uh, so there's a lot of information in here, but basically looking at a gradient from, you know, a grass all the way to a mature pine tree or an oak. So that's the gradient is small vegetation to large vegetation. And you can see um, this circle is really what's key to grouse habitat. And they do really well in these younger to um, just, just below mid successional forest or um, forest development and growth. And a combination of shrubs and uh, taller, uh, more a little 10 to 15 year old sapling trees, and then some mature, some some level of older trees for um, brood or nesting and and other features. So, but you can see the bottom here is basically just the take home is there's a whole bunch of different characteristics within this circle that provide for different aspects of their different points of their life their lifespan throughout the year. So different cover for winter feeding, different cover for ne for nesting. Um, and there's a the best combination or the best habitat for grouse is a mix of all of these. And that's why I mentioned a mix of young forest cover types is key for grouse um, to do well. Uh, this is just another example. Um, and I don't folks may pick this up right away, but you can see there's these this pattern here. Um, which is associated with um, logging and cutting. So we have really good grouse habitat in 3.5 million acres of northwestern Maine because of the active um, forestry that goes on and, and harvests. And the key is to provide a rotation of as the forest grows older and then there's cutting adjacent, then there's new younger habitat created and grouse and other species do pretty well with that. Actually, a lot of songbird species do well in these younger growth forests. So because of its rotation and active and changing cover type and growth um, up in the North Main Woods, we have quite a robust population of rough grouse. Um, and because of that concept of continual rotation, this I'll try to explain this. This is sort of the the uh, the design for habitat management to encourage uh, good grouse populations. And the take home here, just don't worry about all these references, but you can see there's different cover types into this these square patterns reference a different stage in development of forest or field growth. Uh, of course, because you can start, you start, you, you cut a patch and then it grows to a certain uh, density to, a, and then it continually grows. But if you have a combination of this, um, these, all these components throughout a larger patch of woods, then you're providing the different cover needed for the different uh, periods of their annual cycle. And so this is a good example of a active um, patch of wildlife management area that the our department maintains and owns down in um, Montville, the Fry Mountain Wildlife Management Area, where you can see these are the different rotational cuts. So this was cut more recently, and then this has grown up. And then you can see, if you look hard enough, there's different stages of growth. So you can just imagine, transfer these, these are nesting, predicted nesting sites for, um, reproducing grouse, so you can just kind of transfer that and expect probably, you know, maybe six or seven uh, nesting grouse within that patch. So the key is to, for the habitat to be changing and have different components all at the same time. Um, so that uh, transitions into the other aspect of my position is to uh, try to answer questions through research, and there hasn't really been a lot of um, grouse research in, in contemporary times. Um, I think there was some studies back in the 70s. So we uh, were interested in seeing, um, getting basic information about grouse in terms of 
um, survival, nesting, habitat use, and reproduction. And because of their their value as a game species and interest in harvest, we also wanted to check in um, after decades and see what level of harvest that grouse were experiencing um, to make sure that what we find was was what can, what's considered sustainable. Um, and I'll go a little more detail into the slide because I, I don't want to assume everyone knows what what we're doing here. But this is a, a telemetry study. So basically, um, this is a caller that uh, ex uh, ex uh, emits an FM signal that you can pick up with a receiver. Uh, there's a handheld receiver and an antenna. So you can actually put a caller with a transmitter on an individual grouse and then track that grouse throughout the year, fall, winter, spring, summer, um, putting it on males and females. So with the females, you can track them and um, determine if they're nesting and if they're re successful. And then you can observe broods that have uh, collared grouse with broods um, by following them and tracking them. So it's a pretty uh, useful piece of technology that's used on a lot of different species from moose all the way to, I want to say butterflies, but don't quote me on that. I know there's some tags, but um, but the concept is, is to mark individuals to follow them throughout their life cycle to see how they do successfully with bre uh, breeding and then other um, pressures and that are, uh, affect their survival, like harvest, the harvest of species. So we did this. Um, in Montville at the Fry Mountain Management Area, and then also uh, east of Old Town in the Stud Mill Road. And I don't know if folks are familiar with that, but that's basically um, similar to the North Main Woods. It's a active um, uh, patch of woods, uh, thousands and thousands of acres of industrial um, harvest and forestry. <clears throat> so one thing that we determined or followed and, and observed was um, the different uh, cover types. So referencing back to what I was talking about and having a mix of different cover types for nesting, um, we actually found that not all grouse selected these sort of more mature um, stands. Uh, I think about a third of the ones we marked did, but um, you can see that this grouse was behind one of these trees and nesting at the base of uh, the trunk of the tree. So she was uh, she used utilized that as part of her cover for nesting. And then um, I don't think I have a slide right away, but um, using a very different habitat for when she has an, a, bro a brood or uh, when she has her young, when she's raising her young, it's very different from what where she nested. Uh, one thing that we were able to look at and determine and uh, was the egg laying and hatch dates during the telemetry study. And I have the numbers with uh, April 28th slash June 4th. That's the uh, initial attempt or initial uh, initiating of nest at first. And some birds actually would lose or abandon depending on what conditions they were faced with or if the predator found them um, and then renest. So there was these two waves of nesting. Um, initially April 28th was the initiation date and then June 4th was the hatch date. May 24th um, initiation on the second wave and July 1st for the hatch date. And we found that which was not surprising but Females were subjected to mortality at a high rate when they were with brood. So it's very costly to raise young. 27% um, of females that we tagged or marked with transmitters were killed by predators while they had their broods. And you can see the blue line here is birds with no brood. So quite a difference. So it's very costly to try to reproduce and, and raise young for grouse. Um, this is a sort of a pie chart that has been used in many different studies or over the course of several different studies in several different areas, sort of the, the general trends for mortality um, of marked grouse. And you can see that 
67% of the mortality was has been attributed to, in general, across these studies, um, from avian predators, 16% from mam mammalian predators, um, and hunting contributed to about 15% of the studies uh, in general. And that 15% uh, was um, through assessment and um, evaluation and um, monitoring down the down the line following hunting pressure or harvest of that level was what's considered within the realm of sustainable. Um, there's a concept that there's hunting either is compensatory or or additive, and the concept is if you're at a compensatory level, it's a low enough level of hunting that the mortality associated with it is um, birds that likely would have perished from other causes. Um, if you inc get to a point where would it was be considered additive, where uh, there's too much harvest pressure that it you're harvesting beyond what is normally expected to um, die in the course of the year. So um, that number would be um, not sustainable. But this 15% is the accepted grouse management kind of um, target of harvest that we we're looking for. So that was our baseline to go by. And this uh, this is a, a chart of the the harvest of the radio tag birds from our study. So this is 2014 to 2016. On average, um, across those years, we had about a 16% harvest. So we're pretty close to that 15% mark. So we feel pretty we feel comfortable that our harvest is considered con compensatory and sustainable at that level. Um, and you can see, <clears throat> of course, October, the hunting season runs from October through December, and most of the harvest of grouse is in October um, during the early part of the, the hunting season. Um, This is a monitoring tool that we use um, to track uh, using drumming males as an index to the growth population. And so what the, <clears throat> the basics for that survey, the rough grouse drumming survey, is males, I'm sure many people have heard grouse drumming in the spring, but if you uh, run a seven mile, well, our, our transects are seven miles. We stop every half mile, listen for five minutes, and count the number of grouse that are drumming. And so that can serve as a index to <clears throat> how the population is doing when you look at um, your route over time. And we have five different uh, route, routes that we run to compare between uh, south, central, western, northern, central, and then eastern Maine. And over time, you can start to develop an understanding of population trends. And this is what the data looks like after. So what this is is a chart of the surveys from 2015 to 2019 in those five different areas. Uh, the two asterisks indicate that in 2019, we don't have data from uh, the moose horn or stud mill. Um, we weren't able to run those. But um, you can see that uh, this is a. When I look at this, I indicates to me that grouse um, have different uh, population trajectories in different parts of the state because a lot of what influences grouse is weather. And you can expect that the weather changes quite a bit and it's different in different areas and and between years as well in different areas. So, um, but in general, you see that there's good years and bad years and this is a pretty good example of the habitat kind of really allowing for robust populations when conditions allow namely weather during the breeding season um, fry mountain is the managed area that i showed you pictures of uh, the, the grouse blocks that we were cut to manage for and encourage grouse habitat and then the stud mill road is a um, that industrial forest active cutting um, 
changing and rotational habitat. Um, so those are good metrics that um, indicate where habitat is high quality. You get these periods of, of um, abundance. Excuse me. Um, that's uh, pretty much wrapped up my presentation. And then I wanted to share with you, hopefully this video plays, but this is a video uh, Bangor Daily News came out with us um, back in when we were doing the study. And I thought it would be a good snippet into what, what it was like to be in the field and some of the grouse um, behavior that we saw. And I just want to make sure that I note that this study was both with our department, Maine Fish and Wildlife, and University of Maine out of Orono. A, a pretty a successful cooperation of research over three years that um, we were both very active in. And hopefully this plays. I'll see on on my end. I can't, unfortunately can't hear anything. I'm not oh, sure. No. I know. Hopefully, it's just my technology and everyone else can hear. But I just wanted to give you a little heads up. Okay. Um, if yeah. um, people it's in the, the audience, me, I can't hear a thing. Oh well. We can see some of the video footage, though. I think. <laughs> yeah, is the video coming through? Okay. It's gotten much clearer on my screen at this point. Okay. Well, I'll let it run. Okay. <clears throat> I guess I could uh, narrate. <clears throat> sure. <clears throat> Yeah, this is, so that's a trap um, that we, they basically, we put traps out, um, they're about 50 feet long, and on either end, it's basically like a lobster trap where um, they go into a funnel and they can't get out. And we checked uh, in the morning and right after dark, to make sure that we don't leave anything in overnight. So that's the funnel there. And unfortunately, this was good. Good. Uh, we had a really good capture night when Bangor Daily News came out. So we were fortunate, but we're just releasing them back to where we caught them. But we caught over 257, I think, individual grouse during the three years of the study between the two spots. So wow. both areas were, had a pretty high abundance of grouse. <clears throat> and just letting them go after we mark them with everything, got collars measured uh, and banded. So, well, that's unfortunate, but we got some video of it. But yeah, that was pretty much what I had. I uh, appreciate you listening and happy to entertain any questions. Thank you so much, Kelsey. Oh, I that was like wonderful. 
Yeah, I feel like I learned a lot. So yeah, people in the audience, if you would like to stick a question in the chat box, feel free to do so um, or raise your little hand. Um, and then maybe Martha and I can start with some questions. Um, I, I'm thinking of one and um, recently I was looking at, a, it was actually a children's picture book and they talked about how grouse really like um, the invasive barberry bush. And I, I was just curious if that was just something that kind of was randomly put in the picture book or if you have ever seen that in your research or in your experience. Uh, yeah, I mean, it's, you know, regardless of, they don't really know it's invasive, but they do, it does have um, good nutritional value. So I'm not surprised that they would capitalize on it. And unfortunately it does invade into a lot of the natural habitat. So, but fortunately they, they do get a nutritional value out of it. Interesting. Yeah. So it could be like that balance of if there's just a few good nutritional benefit, but if there's a ton, it might like impinge on their natural habitat as well. Yeah. And, the, and even if it doesn't hinder them, it probably hinders or compromises other species that, you know, if, if there's too much of it. Yeah. Sure. And Kelsey, I'm wondering about the drumming. Can you give us any details on how they make that happen? Yeah, I wish that, uh, I was trying to find a video that, well, we wouldn't have been able to hear it anyway, but um, you can see, well, in this picture, their tail, you just imagine that's the male on the right, <clears throat> stands up on a log. They tend to, generally tend to find logs up and that they can cast a noise, but <clears throat> they use their tail and they brace themselves and then they use their wings um, basically pumping their wings into their chest is how they make the noise. So, mm -hmm. cool. and that's uh, to, to attract yeah, people. Yeah, I often hear them and only see them for a second or two before they're flushed. Yeah, there's some pretty good uh, YouTube videos on drumming though. I think Audubon has one too. Cool. We have two hands raised in the audience. Um, so, Looks like Carol Gregory here is at the top. So or now we have three hands. Um, Carol, I'm going to allow you to talk. And I think you just have to unmute yourself. Hi, I was trying to chat, but it says it's disabled. But I was wondering, what's the difference between a grouse, a partridge, and a termagan? Is that how you say it in Canada? Oh, yeah. Yep. Well, that's a great question. And I'm glad you brought it up. There is no difference between a rough grouse and a partridge. I think that partridge is the the uh, just a different name that, that they've developed been assigned. Um, a lot of people refer to grouse in name as partridge. Um, ptarmigan there are different spe uh, species, but they're in the same guild, I believe. So um, ptarmigan, rough grouse, uh, sage grouse. They're all in the same same family, I believe, actually. Um, so ptarmigan is just another species in, in the grouse or gallinus family. Um, and we don't, I don't believe we have ptarmigan in Maine. Uh, we used to, uh, but you find those also in sort of the northern latitude and higher altitudes. Thank you. Thanks, Carol. I think I just fixed the chat just so everyone knows. Um, so, but it looks like we do have a couple more hands. Oh, one hand is down. Um, let's, I guess let's take a question from the chat and then we'll go back to a hand. We, we tend to like kind of alternate a little bit. Um, Martha, do you want to read the chat question? Or maybe Kelsey can see it. Uh, sure. Yes. Um, we have a question from John. It says, how important is overwinter wintering mortality and what happens with reduced snowpack? What are the potential effects of changing winter climate? Yeah, um, that's another good question. Um, winter is, I believe, the highest rate of mortality. So it is a critical time other than females um, reproducing. Um, so it's a pretty critical time. Yeah, that's a tough one. I don't really, you know, you think of the snow cover is important for, um, you know, refuge from predators and the cold. Um, 
I think over time we'll probably see some change and likely a negative effect on grouse, but I I don't know of anything that's showing that at this point, but I would assume with a major change like that, it's going to affect them and likely towards the negative. So we might see a shift in their range and, you know, it may creep creep further and further north. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I don't know if that's what we're seeing. I think it's, we're seeing um, grouse numbers, pretty low numbers south of us. I think we attribute a lot of that to uh, habitat isn't conducive anymore as much. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of changing, uh, there's not a lot of uh, forestry. And so, but uh, I would expect that yeah, a rain shift would likely occur over time. Well, thank you. Um, looks like Catherine Hart has a hand up. So I will allow to talk. And then if you would like to unmute yourself, and then it looks like we have more questions in the chat as well. And Catherine, if it was like a mistake or you, you've changed your mind, no worries. Um, and just let us know in the chat box. <laughs> Sometimes that happens. Um, I While guess we're waiting for her, there is a there is a question about what book is on the screen. I think they're looking for the image there that's so beautiful. Um, uh, the title of it is The Happy Family. Uh, yeah, I can't actually read it. <clears throat> Sorry. Yeah. And then there's another question, someone who arrived late, but said that um, they know sometimes that rough grouse kind of follow humans around. One spent a lot of time while visiting my sister-in-law when she was outside doing some yard work. Have you had experiences like that? Yeah, we, we get a call like that, it seems like every year or two. It's, it's really interesting. People call, um, or I can think of a few stories. There was a a guy that was, he would go out and cut in his woodlot, and a grouse would follow him, eventually would ride on the back of his ATV, and then oh. sit, sit on logs while he cut them. So, um, <laughs> And then I've heard another story where a grouse would come up to somebody's porch and rap on the door. Um, so, you know, the thought is, is that they're young males that are teed up with a lot of, uh, Hot spot, I guess you call it, and I, you know, they, they kind of lock into people, I think, and they're either territorial or they're actually, they are affectionate because of their, um, because of their, you know, hormones are way, way kicked in, and I know people will have that throughout the year too, but I think it's a lot to do with their hormones. Hmm, that's fascinating. I think um, one of the questions, another question in the chat box was kind of touching on that as well, um, talking about how they're in um, Scudic Acadia they, and they, uh, the rough grouse seem almost tame and not afraid of people as they walk by. I'm just wondering if this is normal grouse behavior. Yeah, are those, do they say spruce grouse or rough grouse? Oh. Yeah. I think they said rough grouse, but then okay. it's the occasional yeah. spruce grouse. Yeah, gotcha. Yeah. Yeah, I don't know. For whatever reason, spruce grouse don't be tend not to be um, afraid of people. Sometimes they're referred to as the fool bird, but um, I think they're just accustomed, like anything. Um, they're, there's, they're, I don't believe you can hunt down there. They're probably not threatened, and um, I think birds pick up on danger. I know that with turkeys. You could have turkeys walk right up to you, and then um, in some places they won't even, you won't even know they're there. They'll be gone just because I think there's different pressures in different places. Mm. And someone asked if both male and female are um, territorial. Um, females, not so much. They would be protective of their young um, and their, their nest site, but the males are 
the more aggressive territorial of the two. Hmm. And you mentioned the avian predators and the um, mammal predators. What specific um, animals are we talking about that like to eat grouse? Yeah, quite a, uh, quite a mix. Um, but goshawks are pretty heavy predators on grouse. Um, owls as well. Um, and then the mammals at different stages, uh, there's egg robbers like skunks and raccoons. And then there's um, bobcats, coyotes that potentially might sneak up on a nesting hen. Um, so anything that walks or flies that can access that grouse pretty much will eat them. So. Mm -hmm. Um, in terms of like your research, and I, I understand there's like a lot of pretty good rough grouse habitat in northern Maine, not so much in southern Maine. Is Maine Inland Fisheries and Wildlife like encouraging people to do any sort of um, like backyard rough grouse habitat? Like if they um, are able to like make a little clearing in their woods or is there a need for that at this point? Um, it's down in sort of the central southern part of Maine, yeah. For sure, um, yeah, and we we encourage people that are interested in managing their land for wildlife. Um, it's very encouraged. Um, there's different programs. We actually have a, a program, an actual uh, private lands biologist that works directly with uh, landowners to develop management plans and um, focal areas and things. But yes, for sure, um, it's, it's encouraged and. Um, the other cool thing about managing for grouse is you're also managing for other quite a list host of other species, especially songbirds that utilize. You can think of like open goldenrod fields in the fall and um, different shrub shrub cover with berries. A lot of songbirds utilize the same types of habitat. Some of the habitats that grouse use too. So when you manage for grouse, you're managing for other species as well. Awesome. It looks like we have another question in the chat box. Um, Kelsey, you can probably see this, but I'll read it out loud. Last summer while walking, we had a grouse come up from the ditch, wailing and pretending to be wounded, but we realized it was trying to distract from their root in the underbrush. Oh, cool. I guess it was more of like a loss. Yeah. <laughs> question. <laughs> I... Yeah, Landa, your um, audio is trailing off, so I can't make out your words. I don't know if mine's any better. I, I can read it. I, I, I got the chat. Oh, you can? Okay. Yeah, I'll read it. Okay. Thank uh, you. Last summer while walking, we had a grouse come up from the ditch, wailing, pretending to be wounded, but realized it was trying to distract from the brood in the underbrush. Um, yeah, I mean, that's uh, the, the w wounded. A lot of bird species do that, as you probably know, but that's, uh, um, I guess, hopefully you kept your distance and did a big circle and let them be. They're fascinating animals. Yeah. Can you guys hear me again? Well, that might be it for questions. And I think our, oh yeah, you're back. <laughs> Okay, I think there's a bit of a lag, unfortunately. <laughs> Martha, we're getting thank yous in the chat box. So everyone's really appreciated your presentation, Kelsey. I, we, we appreciate the time it took to share it with us, and uh, we'll all be on the lookout for our grouse as we walk through the woods. Well, thanks for having me. I appreciate it. All right. Well, thank you so much. And um, we look forward to um, having more webinars and hope our audience can join us in the future. Thank you. All right. Great. Have a good evening. Thank you. Bye. Um, I don't know if people can hear me, but if you can, the recording will be available.
<laughs> Hi, Martha, can you hear me now? I can hear you now, yes. <laughs> yeah, I don't know what happened. It just like, it got so slow, you couldn't make out your words, but now you're back. So thank you for wrapping it up. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Well, thank you. I'm a little rusty here, but oh, we'll it's get so good. Oh my gosh. <laughs> I'm a little rusty too from not having done it quite as often recently. Um I yes. well, I, you're the a pro. pro. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> All right, Martha, have a good night. All right. See you later. Bye.